Welcome back to Module 3. In this video, we're going to be starting our discussion of Chapter 5, which will take us through several different videos uh, for us to understand the nature of light, because that is the main type of observation that we can make in astronomy to study objects outside of our solar system. So let's get started. Now, light, when we use that term in astronomy, is a specific term that describes all of electromagnetic radiation. It's a pretty big term, so let's break that down a little bit. The word electromagnetic means that it's a phenomenon that we're talking about that deals with electricity and magnetism, and the way that those two different ideas connect with each other. And then radiation is a science word for the description of energy moving from one place to another. It has a lot of negative connotations in our everyday um, lives. Either we think about um, nuclear radiation or we think about the, the health consequences of needing to do radiation therapy. But it simply means energy moving from one place to another in the context of science. What's really important for us to understand right at the start of this chapter is that when we use the word light, we are not just talking about the light that our eyes can see. That type of light is called visible light, but we need to broaden our understanding of all of the different types of electromagnetic radiation uh, that encompasses this entire term. So let's start by making sure we understand what light truly is. Now, light acts like a wave and like a particle. That's a simple enough sentence to write down, and it's worth writing down in our notes, but for us to understand that, both as students in this class and as humanity in general, takes a lot of effort. It took centuries for scientists to actually figure out that light has both properties of being a particle and properties of being a wave. And if we look at the dates here, our understanding actually jumped back and forth. And rather than th realizing that light was doing both of these things, in 1700s, when Isaac Newton wrote out his big optics textbook, he was firmly in the camp that light was simply particles. If we took sunlight and we shined it through prisms, we would see red particles and yellow particles and blue particles. Uh, and that was that. And then it took about 150 years for someone to come up with a different theory, and that was Maxwell's treatise on electricity and magnetism and all of the equations that describe those fields. And Maxwell identified that if he is describing mathematically these physical fields, then there must be a wave that can propagate through those fields. In the same way that if we have a surface of a lake, we can have waves on that surface, the existence of these electromagnetic fields meant that a wave should be present there. And then it took a couple of decades for Heinrich Hertz to be able to show that that worked with experimentation. So Heinrich Hertz created radio waves and detected them using this framework that Maxwell had created. And so then by the end of the 1800s, we were kind of as a society um, of scientists, firmly on board with the idea that light was a wave. It has wave properties of wavelength and frequency and speed, and we're going to be talking about all of those. Uh, but then there were some experiments that showed that light couldn't simply just be a wave. It wouldn't work that way. We won't get too much into the details of these experiments because they're outside the scope of our curriculum. But in 1900, Max Planck discussed the phenomenon of black body radiation, which we will be learning about in a later video, and identified that for it to behave the way it does, when light is interacting with matter, or being emitted by matter rather, it had to be emitted in little tiny packets of amounts, so like a particle of energy. And then in 1905, Albert Einstein was studying the photoelectric effect, which had baffled scientists for a little bit, and his explanation, which fit all of the observations and experiments, was that when light is being um, absorbed by matter, it is only absorbed in little packets of energy as well. And for all of the things that Albert Einstein is known for, that 1905 uh, explanation of the photoelectric effect is the only thing he's won a Nobel Prize for, which gives us a sense of just how important this question of figuring out what light is um, really, really comes down to. 
So we introduce ourselves to this term called photon, really important term in our glossary, we'll make sure that we write it down, which is the way to describe the particle of light, even though a photon, which is acting as this particle, has no mass. It is still the way that we describe this little packet of information um, of light energy. But the key thing is a photon, a single particle of light, has wave properties also, which is why this interesting dynamic of light working both ways uh, has to be the explanation that we have. So let's talk about these wave properties. Sound is also a wave. My uh, vocal cords are shaking the air uh, to the microphone, which is then recording that wave form uh, to be the sound that your speakers produce. But let's talk about what makes light and sound, which are both wave phenomena, the same or different. So I want you to pause the video to think through the question of which of the four statements provided is true. So pause and think through them, take as long as you need. And when you look through all of these, the empty space uh, idea is important for us to understand that we are talking about if we were to look at something way out in the universe, what is going to make it all the way down to our telescopes uh, here on the ground or our satellites in orbit around Earth? Now, we have to have identified the fact that light can travel through empty space. Otherwise, our night sky would be pitch black. We receive sunlight every day. We receive starlight at night. We receive moonlight all over the uh, different times of the day and month. So we have to rule it down to... It Either, one, they both, light and sound, can travel through empty space, or two, that only light can travel. Because we know that we receive light from outer space. And then, if you were able to narrow it down to option two, that is the correct one, um, sound needs material in between to be able to propagate. When I described that process of you hearing my voice. I was talking about shaking the air molecules a little bit. We need that particular property. So anytime that we talk about any wave at all, we need to know a couple of different things. What is the wave shaking for it to have a wave pattern? And what does it move through? And is it traveling parallel or perpendicular to that stuff? So let's start with this first uh, diagram. Uh, I was recently at a concert, and uh, as we were waiting for the, the band to come on, uh, somebody started the wave in the Van Andel Arena, and it just kept going around because we were kind of bored at that point. Um, and if you've ever done the wave in a stadium, either for uh, a music concert or a sports uh, stadium, you know that all you have to do if you're even feeling low energy is just kind of raise your arms and then wait for the, the process to pass. You can stand up if you're really excited. Uh, and just like these little stick figures, we don't have to get out of our seats to still be part of that pattern. The stuff that the wave is shaking, in this case a, a human wave, um, the stuff that is being shaken are the people, and they are going up and down, but the wave pattern is going side to side. That means the wave we're looking at right here on the screen travels perpendicular to the material it shakes. The shaking is vertical, and the traveling is horizontal. So that's a perpendicular. If we think about sound waves, when we think about sound waves, what we're now seeing with all of these little dots are individual atoms or molecules in the air. And what we see is when we keep track of that wave pattern, the molecules are shaking left and right, and the wave pattern is moving to the right, which means that the stuff being shaken is the air itself, and the pattern is moving parallel to that stuff. If we don't have stuff, there is nothing for us to be able to shake, and we can't travel through parallel to stuff we're not shaking. That's why sound can't travel through empty space. And then this last one is a jump rope, but it's gonna be a way for us to think about um, light as a wave too. If we shake the rope, then the rope itself moves up and down, but the rope doesn't shift sideways, the same way that people in the stadium are not shifting sideways, but we do see that pattern move perpendicular to the shaking. So light moves perpendicular to what it shakes, 
And the important thing is what it shakes are electromagnetic fields. That is why we have to call it electromagnetic radiation. It's complicated and we don't have to draw all of this out. And for our curriculum purposes, we don't have to understand the true details. That would be a physics class or a um, kind of astronomy for majors class. But what we do want to recognize is as the electric fields and magnetic fields are shaking, they shake perpendicular to the direction of motion. It might be a 3D process, but we can still stick with this idea of perpendicular. And we can visibly list a wavelength of one peak to the next peak, either for the electric field or the magnetic field. And that wavelength is distance between like points. So peak to peak or trough to trough, whatever um, you may have heard in a previous class is still gonna be relevant here. And on the diagram, we see um, the wavelength is from the very top point of one peak to the next. That's measured in meters because it is a true distance. We could get out a ruler and measure it on our screen or our piece of paper. And then the frequency is how many waves are passing every single second. So if this were an animation, we would kind of get a stopwatch and count, all right, how many are we seeing every second? And that would be a frequency. The unit is hertz, but that is effectively waves per second. So if the frequency is seven, that's seven waves per second. Now, light numbers are a lot bigger than that, but the idea is still the same. It's waves per second. So if we think about how quickly these waves would move, given a particular wavelength and frequency, we get a relation called the wave equation, a relation between wave properties. The speed of the wave is equal to frequency times wavelength. And that equation right there works for any waves. It works for sound waves. It works for water waves. It works for people in the stadium if they're consistent with how they stand up. And uh, it works for light, certainly. Now, the important thing for light is that when we are talking about waves traveling through empty space, the same speed applies to all of the different types of waves we're going to see. This nice highlighted statement is worth writing down in our notes. The speed of light is the same for all types of light. It gets the symbol C, that letter C. Uh, you may have heard of Einstein's famous equation E equals mc squared. Even if we don't know what it means yet, it will be in our um, slides eventually, that C is the speed of light. It is a number we can write down. Uh, on the slide I have it in meters per second. But different forms of light will have different frequencies and different wavelengths. It's only C that stays constant for all of these forms of light. All right, so now that we've written down that description of the speed of light, we can move on with learning about the different types. Before we do, though, let's make sure we know how to use that um, equation that we just wrote down or just looked at, that the speed is equal to frequency times wavelength. I want you to think about what those descriptions mean, the definitions of wavelength and frequency, and pause the video to answer um, either one or, if you're feeling confident, answer both of these questions. So take as long as you need, read the questions and the options. Okay, hopefully you paused. So the question asks, if the distance between the peaks of a light wave is increased, the wavelength does what? And by definition, if we take those peaks and we stretch them out, we have increased the wavelength. The um, distance that we have to measure with our ruler is all of a sudden bigger. The wavelength has increased by definition. Now, if we took that same light wave and we've already stretched out the wavelength, but it's still moving at the same speed, the frequency has to adjust. If the wavelength has gotten bigger, so if the wavelength goes up, the frequency has to go down. We're seeing fewer of these long waves as they go through. There are fewer waves per second, so the frequency decreases. All right, so the other thing I mentioned is that light acts like a particle too. We introduced this term photon to describe light when it is acting like a particle. 
So that particle of light is called a photon. They don't have mass. They move at the speed of light, the way that I just described. They have the wave properties that we just learned about. Photons are light. It's interchangeable. It's just a way of modeling them. The difference is, and the big discoveries in 1900 with Max Planck and 1905 with Albert Einstein, is that each photon has a finite set amount of energy it carries. And that's different than a constant wave. If a wave is constantly going by us, we can't measure a, a quantifiable piece of energy. But photons do that for us. We don't have to write down these equations if we don't want to. We're not going to be plugging numbers into them. But we do want to be able to recognize the relationships that are being described here. If we write that equation down, then we can see a couple of things. If we get bigger energies, we are also going to get higher frequencies. More waves per second is a higher energy. And if we look at the equation, if energy goes up, then the wavelength, which is on the bottom of the fraction, has to get smaller in order to make that number big. They have an inversely proportional relationship. So high energy forms of light have really short wavelengths so that we can get a whole bunch of waves through um, in a certain amount of time. Those kinds of relationships that I've described in words are captured in this equation, which is why it is valuable to look at and think about and talk through. In later modules, we'll spend more time talking about a topic that is in the chapter here. But the idea of the brightness of something, which we'll spend more time on in later videos, the idea of the brightness of a star or something like that is how many photons it's putting out every single second, how many photons it sends in all directions. So if we were to count how many photons we're seeing, we need a little detector, like a little target that says, okay, we're going to see this many photons. As we get farther and farther away from a source of light, like a light bulb or a star, that brightness goes down faster than just linearly. If we get twice as far away, in order to collect all the same number of photons, we'd have to have four times as many detectors, which means that if we get twice as far away, we get a quarter of the brightness, one fourth. If we were to go three times farther away, we would have one ninth the brightness. This is called the inverse square law, and it will come up in more detail in later chapters. So I'm going to introduce it here, uh, and the discussion of absolute brightness and apparent brightness is for a different video. So we'll just kind of note that this is foreshadowing for more information later. All right, so before we talk through the different types of light, which I've hinted at we're going to do um, a couple of times now, before we talk through them, I want you to pause the video and read through and answer this question. So which of the following listed options is not a form of light? So for each one, kind of think about, does it seem like it could be light? Does it seem like it couldn't? And so the thing that I want us to understand is we have a lot of prior understanding of our everyday use of terms and our everyday use of technologies that we sometimes can get mixed up so the thing that we need to understand is that uh, the correct answer is four. All of the above options, one, two, and three, radio waves, microwaves, and x-rays, they are all forms of light. So let's talk through what we mean by that and the fact that each one of those options that I selected for us has a different technology that's named after the type of light that it uses. All right, so this is a busy slide. Now, we don't have to put all of this information into our notes. We don't even have to come back and review all of this information. But there's a lot of knowledge here that helps try to make some connections to things that we can either think about or um, consider or imagine. And the big things I want to point out is any time that we see an image of the electromagnetic spectrum, what we are describing is all of the possible forms of light. And they are always labeled in an appropriate order, but in the same way that you could have people line up from shortest to tallest or from tallest to shortest, the order is sometimes different when we're looking at left and right, so we always want to look at the numbers that we're looking at. This particular image has long wavelengths on the left and short wavelengths on the right. So if we look at each one of these, 
we can see um, that the sources are shown here for everyday technologies. So radio stations that we might tune into, the microwave in our kitchen uses light to um, vibrate water molecules. Radar systems are a type of light. People glow in the infrared. If you've ever tried to wash your hands with automated sinks or if you've seen yourself on an infrared camera, we glow, we are warm. And then light bulbs produce visible light. They're kind of known to do that. And then as we get to higher and higher energies, shorter and shorter wavelengths, these are technologies that become a little more dangerous, a little higher energy, and therefore we, we try to make sure that we limit our exposure. And so x-ray machines, for example, are very high energy, very short wavelength, using the form of light called x-rays. Let's move on to this diagram, um, and we'll see a second one in just a moment, where when we look now, we see that the order of the um, the order of the types of light is now reversed. We always want to check what order we're being shown this information in. Gamma is on the far left now at the shortest wavelengths, uh, going all the way to radio at the longest wavelengths. We're going to stick with this one for our discussion um, as we wrap up the electromagnetic spectrum so that I can show you the image that is in our textbook um, that you'll see more often. So from the left at the shortest wavelengths, we have gamma rays. Gamma rays are extremely high energy. They are the thing that created uh, the Hulk, right? He had a, um, a nuclear meltdown uh, gamma radiation and that's why he turns green. So we already have in our kind of popular uh, culture conscience that gamma rays are dangerous. X-rays are next for us. X-rays, if we've ever had to have an X-ray at the doctor or if we have X-rays taken of our teeth at the dentist, we know that they like cover up the parts that aren't needing that X-ray image. They leave the room often to press the button. So that gives us a sense that while it might be necessary to have the um, important information for our medical uh, health, they are still dangerous. That helps us mentally put them on the short wavelength, high energy side of the spectrum. And then ultraviolet, UV. Ultraviolet is the reason we put on sunscreen. It helps prevent um, damage to our cells from these high energy forms of light that can make it down partially through Earth's atmosphere. If we look at the picture, though, we see that all of the gamma rays and x-rays from space are helpfully blocked by our atmosphere. Really important for us, especially the ozone, um, but all the different layers that the atmosphere contribute to that blocking. Ultraviolet, part of it makes it down, part of it is blocked, but that's why we put on sunscreen. Visible light makes it all the way down to the surface. That is um, not a coincidence. We would have developed our eyes to be able to see the type of light available to us. So that's right in the middle of the visible spectrum is the types of light that make it through Earth's atmosphere. Infrared light is also sometimes referred to as heat. Um, so when we think about something that is warm, whether it's an oven that's just been turned off or a campfire that we're, that we're putting our hands near but not in the flames, we're actually experiencing and detecting infrared light. If we feel our own um, faces and we feel warmth, that is because we are glowing in infrared light. As we continue on, microwaves, our kitchen microwaves have a particular resonance with water molecules. So microwaves as a type of light are very low energy, but it is this special resonance with water molecules that actually makes them um, work the way that they do and heat up our food. Since we humans are also mostly water, that is why we're told not to put our face right by the microwaves um, and why we have this sense that the technology itself might be a little bit of a concern, but it's not because the form of light is high energy. And then radio waves, super low energy. Through the room that you're listening in right now, there are radio stations um, sending all that type of light through the space you're in, because if you were to tune to one of them, you'd start to hear the music through the technology that is picking up that type of light and turning it into sound for you.
And radio waves are also a type of light that goes all the way to Earth's surface, which means we can really easily communicate with satellites and communicate with the International Space Station and send um, out uh, messages and receive radio wave signals from space. That's our big communication window um, in astronomy. I would encourage you to um, pause the video to look at any of the different diagrams that I have here. Um, you can also uh, look at the posted slides to make sure that you understand these types of light and feel confident in putting the high energy forms of light together on the dangerous side, the low energy forms of light together on the um, safer side and visible is right in the middle for us, very handy. Uh, this slide here, I'm not going to read out all of the different information. It's more of a useful reference if you're curious. Wavelength ranges in numbers uh, and typical astronomical sources, since that's the focus of our curriculum. And if you look through all of these, um, you'll note that um, for visible light, stars is a typical source. Stars are also creating different types of light too. Our sun produces a lot of ultraviolet, remember the sunscreen, um, and it's not even very hot, but it peaks in the visible wavelengths. So this may be a useful chart to write down just to be able to refer back to, not to memorize, but be able to, when we learn new sources, you kind of think about, okay, what are they most known for um, creating? Or where is that radiation coming from if we're studying it in space? So a question for you to think about those different types of light that we've talked about. Pause the video for as long as you need to answer each one of these questions. All right. So the type of light that has the least energy, that's the least dangerous light, is radio waves. That's the one that's filling our room right now, um, even if we can't see them. So radio waves are very um, long wavelengths and they have very low energy. They're not dangerous. For the shortest wavelength, shortest wavelength we want to associate in our head with high energy and dangerous, that's gamma rays. That's the, the Hulk kind, right? The short wavelengths uh, are consistent with the really, really high energy types of light. So that's gamma rays. The lowest frequency, low frequency means very few waves per second. So chill, calm, low energy again. So that would be back to radio waves. And then this was the trick to see if you had written down that highlighted statement from earlier in our slides here. None of those light uh, waves travel slower. They are all traveling at the speed of light. So that last bullet point, if you wrote down radio or really any single form of light, you need to cross it out and in big capital letters encircled, all forms of light travel at the same speed. For our purposes in astronomy, we're dealing with empty space. That is absolutely true and important to us. So make sure that you have that written down in your notes. That's where we're gonna finish for um, this video. If you have any questions or concerns about these types of light, I encourage you to kind of rewatch this portion or look through our lecture notes or the textbook so that we feel confident with these new terms that we've learned about and we can then apply them to how astronomers study different forms of light from different sources. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.